What I'm gonna to try to do in the next few minutes, and some of this is probably, you, you probably know more about these products under your conditions than I do. I'm talking about work that I've done with most of these products, except for isoxaflutol. All of my information there comes out of the, what I've read in the literature. But I was gonna talk, John gave me a list of uh, all these products and said, you know, can I talk about each one of them? And, well, I can talk about them and we'll see where how it goes. But I'd be, if, if your experience doesn't agree with what I'm saying, then uh, I'd like to know that so that I know where I'm right and where I'm wrong. Uh, the take home message, if you're interested, and I don't expect you to read this, but it's in the paper, where I've looked at all the different herbicides and just put together what I consider a summary of uh, each of these herbicides. Again, this is probably information you already know in terms of volatility, factors affecting the binding to the soil, how tightly or, or, uh, they bind to the soil, their leachability, how they are degraded in the soil, whether or not incorporation is needed, and uh, their residual activity. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about the Greek Group B herbicides, the ALS inhibitors. I know you've had these, uh, particularly the sulfonylureas, for, for a long time. Uh, you, there are differences between the sulfonylureas and the imidazolinones that you, you should be aware of. Uh, all of them are weak acids uh, with a pKa of somewhere between 4 to 5. What does that mean in terms of herbicide behavior? Well, it means that if you have a pH greater than 6 in the soil, these are going to be anionic, and thus they will have a negative charge, and, and that means they will not bind tightly to soils. If you have a pH less than 6, uh, then they will bind more tightly. And their soil binding depends on both soil pH and organic matter. So the lower the pH, the more tightly they bind. But they also show a phenomenon called time-dependent binding. And what that means is that the longer they are in residence with the soil, the more tightly they bind. So this is an example of a mazethapir, or flame as you call it, and the same thing is true for other imidazolones and sulfonylureas, on the relationship between soil pH on the x-axis and soil binding. And soil binding I have here is KD. KD is a ratio of how much herbicide is bound to the soil divided by how much herbicide is in the soil water. So the higher the KD, the more tightly it's bound to the soil. And you can see that there's almost a straight line relationship between soil pH and binding. So that it, under acid conditions or acidic conditions, say pH 4 or 5, uh, they bind very, relatively tightly to the soil, but as you get to higher pH soils, they become almost non-binding, and in some circumstances, they're almost repelled by the soils. This is a phenomenon of time-dependent binding, again with a mazethapir, where if you first, uh, this is in a real-world situation, looking at how much herbicide is in the soil water rather than a batch slurry technique. You can see when you first apply the herbicide to the soil, it's bound very loosely to that soil. But given time, as, as time increases, and we went out to 30 days in these experiments, you can see that you get about a seven-fold increase. And thus, uh, one of the things, the factors of this, and, and this phenomenon occurs relatively rapidly, so even within three days, there's about a threefold increase, is the imidazolones are considered to be uh, leachers. But uh, if you, in the real world situation, you don't necessarily find that, and I think it's because of this effect on this time dependent binding. The degradation of these herbicides is somewhat different. Uh, the imidazolones are primarily degraded microbially. And that means, so the, the microorganisms activity rate dependent on pH, on temperature and soil moisture. So if you have cool temperatures or dry soils, the imidazolinones will not degrade as rapidly as under warmer temperatures and, and more moist. But what's the other interesting thing that you need to keep in mind is this pH effect. All of the imidazolinones degrade more slowly in acidic soils versus basic soils. And by acidic soils, I mean pH is less than six. So the worst case scenario for uh, carryover of uh, or follow crop response to the imidazolones would occur under dry soils with low pH. Uh, even a mazamox, we found a mazamox uh, when in a system, I worked for American Cyanamid for 22 years before I joined uh, USDA and was involved in the discovery and the development of the imidazolones. And we found a mazamox deliberately looking for an imidazolone that degraded more, more quickly than a mazethapir particularly. And we found it in a mazamox. Uh, it 
it degrades probably three times faster in the soil than a mazethapir and has much fewer follow crop responses. But even that herbicide under basic soils less than pH 6 will last longer than, uh, than it will under say pH higher than pH 6. Sulfonylureas are somewhat different. I mean, they are degraded microbially, but their primary method of degradation is through chemical hydrolysis of the sulfonylurea bridge, particularly things like chlorosulfuron. And these are different than the imidazolones in that the, it's an opposite effect. They last much longer under basic conditions than under acidic conditions. And so uh, that's not necessarily true for things like Express or, or the more shorter residual sulfonylureas because those are degraded very rapidly. But even those will degrade more slowly under basic as opposed to acidic conditions. So if you compare the two compounds, the main thing in, in terms of degradation in the soil is pH, low pH reduces the rate of degradation of the imis, high pH reduces the degradation of the sulfonylureas. These herbicides from pre-emergence application uh, can be incorporated by rainfall or tillage. Uh, they should be incorporated within two weeks, but it can be a light incorporation. And they're not as sensitive as things like metolachlor, etc. But they do need water for activation in the soil. So if you have apply them to a dry soil, expecting pre-emergence activity, uh, they're not going to be as they're not going to be active until the water comes. In terms of crop residue, uh, they're both fairly hydrophilic, meaning water loving, and so they're readily washed from crop residue with 10 millimeters of rainfall or level. And it's from a soil applied application, it's not a major effect on efficacy of either one of these types of herbicides. Let's move on to peroxisulfone and metolachlor. This may be of more interest to you. Uh, the group K herbicides. They're both non-ionic, which means that there's, they, there's no major effect of soil pH in terms of their binding. And they both interact primarily with soil organic matter. Uh, if you look at this uh, s slide here, this is uh, a kind of a summary. We looked at 30, 30 different soils with varying levels of uh, soil organic matter, clay, silt, sand. And one of the things that's interesting about peroxisulfone is it's much less Hydro, or water soluble than uh, esmetolachlor. If you look at that first line there, you see uh, peroxisulfone solubility is about three and a half milligrams per liter, where the esmetolachlor is about two orders of magnitude higher. And they both have a very similar KOW, which means how fat soluble they are. But if you look at their KD, metolachlor binds approximately twice as tightly to the soil as peroxisulfone. Uh, and this is averaged across all those soils. So per, the average KD across all these 30 soils is approximately four. Peroxisulfone is about 1.7. So it's not a tight binder. And this shows you that we looked at six different Australian soils comparing peroxisulfone and metolachlor. And this is the peroxisulfone binding. And this shows this relationship between soil organic matter and binding. You can see there's a, the x-axis is soil organic matter in percent. And the y-axis is again is this KD. One thing you can see that it's, it's not bound very tightly under low uh, organic matter. And that clay plays little or no role in the binding of peroxisulfone. So we had a calci clay that had a relatively low 0.8 organic matter and peroxisulfone did not bind very tightly to that soil. When you got up to the soil, the heavier soils of, of organic matter in the 4 to 5% range, which I assume is almost like a muck here in, Colorado, in Australia, uh, it binds much more tightly. Both herbicides are degraded by soil microorganisms. However, peroxisulfone uh, lasts about twice as long in the soils compared to metolachlor. This is some work that we did. This is laboratory work where we looked at the degradation of S. metolachlor versus, you see KIH-485. I should have changed these slides. That was the, the uh, number that we had for peroxisulfone at the time. But you can see that uh, the dark line is, is this peroxisulfone, the dotted line is, is uh, esmetolachlor, and you can see that the peroxisulfone was degrading uh, less rapidly. And this is in a uh, fairly uh, a loam soil. This is in a very light soil in Colorado, which is more of a loamy sand, uh, kind of more typical of Western Australia, and you can see the, the uh, KIH or the, the peroxisulfone degraded much more slowly than, in this case than the esmetolachlor. 
uh, in a North Carolina soil, which is, uh, in this case, it happened to be a lower pH. Again, you can see the difference, although they, they kind of tended to meet over time. And in an Illinois soil, which is probably one of high organic matter, about P, uh, soil organic matter of about four and a half, again, you can see that uh, peroxisulfone dissipated more slowly than esmetolachlor. And this was some field work that we did in Colorado over two years in a uh, clay loam soil. And uh, both years, the uh, peroxisulfone, the half-life in these soils is about 32 days compared to esmetolachlor of about 18 days. So we generally find that peroxisulfone, at least in our re research, lasts longer than uh, esmetolachlor. One of the things you need to know about these herbicides, at least in our research, is both herbicides are primarily taken up by the emerging shoot in grasses. We did some split pot experiments where we put the herbicide either below the, the seed or above the seed, and we found that the herbicides, particularly uh, metolachlor, but, uh, but also peroxisulfone, were the most effective when the emerging shoot came up through those. Both of them require water for germination or for activation. We did an experiment in which, again, we had a split pot where we put the uh, wet soil or damp soil on the bottom of the pot, covered it with dry soil, uh, with the seeds laying on top of the damp soil and then applied both peroxisulfone and esmetolachlor and then did simulated rainfall at, at zero, one, three, and seven days after treatment. Now this is a worst case scenario because this, the grass was going to germinate and go up through that dry soil. But what we found is one day after treatment, we had perfect control from both of them. Three days after treatment, we, the esmetolachlor, and this is, a, again, I say worst case, so you probably have longer in the field, but we, the esmetolachlor started to break, and by seven days after treatment, it looked like you hadn't sprayed anything because the weeds had come up through the dry soil and had completely escaped the herbicide. I talked earlier today about crop residue uh, and showed that uh, both herbicides can be caught by the residue, but will be washed off, about 80% washed off with as little as 25 millimeters of rainfall. But it did appear that metolachlor could be lost either by some process on the dry uh, residue over time. But again, these were under laboratory conditions. Moving on to trifluralin, I'm sure you're, you're probably very well aware this is an old compound, a group D. Again, it's non-ionic, but compared to the uh, metolachlor and peroxisulfone, it's extremely lipophilic, means he, and it binds extremely tightly to the soil. Where the KDs for uh, peroxisulfone, metolachlor may be in the one to eight or 10 range, the KDs for something like trifluralin is 4,000 means it's bound very, very tightly to the soil or to the organic matter. And thus, these two compounds, even in relatively sandy soils, as long as they have organic matter, do not leach. I did an experiment in the field where I had our organic matter is about 0.8% and it's about 90% sand, and yet the dinitrolanolins leached, didn't go beyond uh, seven and a half centimeters in the soil. But the, uh, but, and so you kind of ask, well, how are these herbicides active? These herbicides are interesting that they're primarily active through the vapor phase rather than through uh, being picked up directly by the plants. And thus, even though they're bound tightly to the soil, they're still available to the plants. One of the other things about these compounds that I'm sure you already know are they're extremely volatile and photo-unstable. And things like, particularly trifloral, need to be incorporated immediately after application. And even with a light incorporation, you're going to lose a certain percentage from the uh, soil uh, because of this volatility. This is an experiment. I, I was, this is not in trifluoral, and I sh should have relabeled this. This is actually pendimethalin that we applied in, under two years uh, where we applied the herbicide, and then I measured how much herbicide was intercepted, and then what was the concentration in the soil uh, three days after application. And you can see that the, the I lost about 60% of the herbicide in those three days because we didn't incorporate it right away. And this is something typical that could happen if you don't incorporate these immediately. Once they're incorporated, which is the dotted line, then they degrade with a half-life of about 40, 35 to 40 days, at least pendimethalin. Uh, but if you don't incorporate them, you'll lose a lot of it from uh, volatility and photodegradation.
These herbicides, unlike the other ones, bind extremely tightly to crop residue and are not easily washed off with rainfall. They will also volatilize from crop residue surfaces. And so if you have a heavy residue situation and you don't expose the soil, you'll lose efficacy due to heavy residue. Triazines, uh, again, herbicides that you are well aware of. They're weak bases unlike the weak acids, and what a weak base means is that actually under acidic conditions they'll take on a positive charge. So they're like the imidazolones and sulfonylureas in that their binding is, is dependent on soil pH, but it's the opposite effect. Under more acidic, well it's the same effect, but under more acidic conditions they'll bind very tightly due to this carrying this positive charge. But the binding still is relatively weak and the KDs are not very high, uh, soil binding. So these herbicides can leach. And their binding is due to not only soil pH, but also to organic matter and, and uh, the uh, cation exchange capacity, particularly in, in uh, acidic soils. Their degradation, as I told you earlier, is both chemical and microbial. In acidic soils, pH less than 6, chemical hydrolysis is the predominant pathway. As I told you earlier, the microbial degradation does produce uh, Produce, can metabolize the herbicide, but the metabolites are phytotoxic. We found in soils that, that have a history of triazine use greater than pH 6, microbial degradation can occur very rapidly in these enhanced soils. Uh, but if you don't have the, the bug there, and I have situations, one system we tested where the farmer stopped using atrazine in about 1985, and there's no sign of uh, enhanced degradation in those cases. Uh, again, this shows what I was talking about earlier. These are soils with different histories of atrazine use, and you can see a, quite a variability in the rates of degradation. Uh, and in this case, it's in the laboratory. The triazines uh, need, can be incorporated with light tillage or rainfall. Like all soil applied herbicides, uh, they need water for activation. And, and I already showed you the effects of crop residue. The triazines can bind to the crop residue, but you'll get wash off relatively easily with uh, up to 25 millimeters of rainfall. The last herbicide, and I'm going to be done pretty early here, is the group uh, is isoxaflutol. This is one compound I haven't done a lot of personal work with, so this is all uh, paper in information. Isoxaflutol is an interesting compound. It's, the parent compound is non-ionic. But actually, the parent compound is not a herbicide. Uh, it is the diketone that is, uh, the isoxaflutol is converted to a diketone in the soil, which is the active form of the herbicide. And that's the part that gets taken up by the plant and uh, is translocated and kills the plant. The binding of the parent compound is, is dependent on soil organic matter and pH with less binding at higher pH but the, dinitro, uh, the diketone is, is more water soluble than the parent acid and is, is less bound to the soil. And so these compounds do have a tendency to leach, uh, particularly if you have heavy rainfall right after application. They can be incorporated with rainfall. One of the interesting things about isoxaflutol that's been observed is that it appears to be reactivated with uh, each rainfall. So if you put it on a dry soil, it'll sit there, and with the first rainfall, it's thought that the parent compound that you put on is, is not metabolized or is not degraded rapidly to the dinitrile or the diketone in dry soil. But when the soil gets wet, so you get a conversion, and then that activates the herbicide. Uh, and then with, if the soil dries out, the, it'll sit there, and then a, re, re, a new rainfall will reactivate the herbicide. Isoxaflutol is degraded chemically to the diketone, which is then converted to an acid by soil microbes. And the soil, or the acid is uh, not as active as the diketone. And these herbicides, because they are so water soluble, are, are intercepted by crop residue, but can be readily washed uh, from the soil or from the crop residue surface. So that's, I went through it a lot faster than I thought. I got 20 minutes. So uh, we're open for questions, or we'll have an early tea break, one of the two.
Well, the binding, this time-dependent binding doesn't make, mean they're unavailable. Uh, they reach, it's an equilibrium type situation. So the problem that you have with, uh, so they're going back and forth. The problem that you have under city conditions is the soil starts being like a slow release type system. And so it, it releases the herbicide too, at a rate that the microorganisms are degrading it, but they only degrade what's in the water. And so if they're bound tightly, the rate of degradation goes down because it has it degrades some of it and then a little more comes off and it degrades it. So that's really what's happening with the pH. But it's not an irreversible binding. It's not like uh, some of the other herbicides, like paraquat. Once paraquat's bound to the soil, it's completely unavailable. Or glyphosate's the same thing. But these, are, like the imidazolones or some of these others, are in an equilibrium situation. Right. And I assume also in the US they're probably using, say, a, team, a one inch factor or a you know, order of magnitude higher. Right, right. Metallic or to overcome that. Right. Okay. Yeah, the rates, the use rate of metolachlor in the US is about one and a half to two kilos per hectare, where the use rate of peroxisulfone will be more in the 150 to 300 gram range. So it's about an order of magnitude. It's inherently more active than metolachlor, just on a biological basis, but I think also because of this less binding to the soil, it's also more bioavailable. There's, so two of those factors are working together, but peroxisulfone is a much more active gram per gram than, say, metolachlor. What's your thoughts on the intersection? It's nice that it came from the Washington Star Wars, but that your what's your uh, something about the distribution of the herbicide? Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting thing, and I'm not absolutely sure. We've looked at that of what the effect. Well, other people, I haven't looked at it of crop residue on the leachability of these compounds. And there is an interaction that's going on. If you have a lot of residue, it, it doesn't tend to leach as much as it will under, uh, say, no residue type, if you have bare soil versus a heavy residue layer, because that residue tends to kind of act like a, a buffer and prevents it from moving as fast as it will under dry soil conditions. Is that what your question is? Or more of the house distributed uniformly over the soil? Oh yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah, the, the rate, that's an interesting question. I know they talked about this morning of the shadowing effect that you get uh, from like a post-emergence, but the same type of thing is going to happen with these pre-emergences that you could tend to get shadowing effects of the herbicide maybe not as high in one area as, an, as another due to interception. Yeah, so well, they are. I mean, of all the herbicides I looked at, probably metolachlor would be more effective than triazines or the imidazolones or even peroxisulfone, because it, just, it doesn't tend to bind as much. Well, it's not unique to the imidazolones. You'll see the same thing for almost all soil-applied herbicides. I've seen similar situations with peroxisulfone uh, and with, with uh, other herbicides that they tend to... What, what's happening in the soil is, if you look at the soil, it's, of course, it's not homogeneous. It's, it's really clumps of, of clay, usually coated with organic matter or something like that. And, and, and what you're seeing, really, is the herbicide penetrating into deeper parts kind of penetrating into the organic matter in such a way that it's not coming out as fast. And so you'll see this, it takes time for it to get in, but it also takes time for it to get out. But that most herbicides will show this biphasic binding. So if you look at the initial binding will be, unless something like trifluralin or paraquat that bind almost immediately. But with most of these uh, herbicides, metolachlor, peroxisulfone, triazines, et cetera, will show a similar type phenomenon of time-dependent binding. 
that you often don't measure. You have to do the experiments that have to be done separately. Most KD experiments are done at what's called batch slurry, where you have, say, one gram of soil or 10 grams of soil and 10 mils of water. And so you have a lot of water in, in, relationship, show, in relationship to the soil, and that's not what happens in the real world. So if you put the herbicide on a soil that's at field capacity, and then we have a method where we do centrifugation to get the soil water out, you'll see this time dependent, see this time dependent binding. Just a bit of a follow on because currently when they're applying our pre-measured mix of our crop plants looking for a rainfall event, it's forecast, we're running out there and putting our products on in front of that forecast rain. I'm concerned that you know, if we're doing it so close to rain, we're actually trying to leach it. Well, yeah, if you, if you put the herbicide on a dry soil, there's little, little or no interaction going on. And so I've done, I think this is a question you're asking. So if you put it on a dry soil and then you're waiting for rainfall to incorporate it, if you tend to get a, if you get a really heavy rainfall, you'll tend to move it, the herbicide, because it hasn't had time. This time dependent binding really depends on having water in the system or moisture. Not water necessarily, but soil moisture in the system. So if you put it on a bone dry soil, and I've done with this with peroxisulfone to see how fast, like the studies I did with the Australian soils, the, the original question really that why we did the research was under some of these light soils, they weren't getting the level of, of weed control that they wanted or that they expected. And what we found was what was happening, if you put it on a bone dry soil and then apply rainfall, it actually leaches more than if you put it on a damp soil that doesn't have to be field capacity like you know just some moisture there you see less leaching with a heavy rainfall we put on equivalent of 25 millimeters and we could see it moving deeper into these profiles and, and moving out of that top two and a half centimeters which for ryegrass is critical for weed control i don't know if that's your question or not i'm not yeah, sure absolutely. Uh, just i mean in terms of the product that's stable on the Well, you need the rainfall after application. The problem you're going to run into if you, uh, I'm still not absolutely sure I understand the question, but um, the question is, should you apply the herbicide just before rainfall or just after rainfall? Is that the question? Or is it, I'm not absolutely sure what the question is. So, sorry, with this line, like, when we have a few instances where we applied it in front of the rain with, with the rain, we've got very poor weight control. Yeah, that's that is a concern. Yeah, because you don't give it this time. Yeah, well, I think you'd be more, uh, the imidazolones would probably be more sensitive to that than triazines or metolachlor because they tend to bind more tightly to begin with. And so you're probably not going to get it. We've done that. I mean, I compared peroxisulfone to metolachlor. Metolachlor doesn't leach anywhere near as much as, as uh, say, peroxisone or the imidazolones. Atrazine is probably similar to the imidazolones, uh, but not as sensitive. So if you, you'd be better off applying it to a damp soil so that you have some interaction rather than apply it to a dro bone dry soil just before a severe rainfall because I think what you're seeing is probably the herbicide is leaching out of that top soil profile because it hasn't had time to bind.
Well, it's probably slightly off topic from this gym, but my understanding with glyphosate is that when you apply it, it binds to the soil pretty quickly and then it's got half life, maybe 40 odd days in the soil. Um, I've just seen you on email getting around where uh, one of your colleagues in the US is blaming glyphosate residue in the soil for everything from zinc deficiency through to cancer or less to Obama winning the election. Right. Uh, Yeah, this question comes up frequently. Uh, a guy is going out saying this stuff, his name is Huber, and he's an ex-plant pathologist, a retired plant pathologist from Purdue University. And he has this theory that glyphosate is building up in the soil and that its main mechanism of action is by chelating micronutrients uh, from the plants. And that's causing all sorts of, wreaking all sorts of havoc on uh, plants and everything else. But there's no, di there's no scientific data that supports him. People have looked for these types of things. It's true that glyphosate is a chelator, but it's not a strong chelator, and the concentrations we're spraying it at, it's really having minimal, minimal or no effect. It's also been proven that it is bound to the soil, but it also degrades fairly rapidly. Uh, and so it's not building up. There's no indication it's building up in the soil. And as far as killing plants by uh, chelating micronutrients and stuff, you can measure effects of micronutrients, but the plant's dying, so it's not unexpected that you'll see these things. But it's not because it's a chelator. I mean, this was an early, before they knew the mechanism of action of glyphosate, one of the early uh, uh, speculations was that glyphosate was, or they knew it as the aromatic amino acids, but they don't, weren't sure what the target site was. And one of the early speculations that it was chelating boron, and that was a key cofactor for the, uh, some of the enzymes in that pathway, and that's how it was killing. Well, it turned out not to be true. I mean, if, if he was correct that plants are dying primarily because their micronutrients are be chelated, then putting a new form of EPSP synthase, which is what all the Roundup Ready crops are, would not be resistant because you, you aren't affecting the chelation. What you're affecting is the target site. So I must admit, I, I have a fairly strong view about it, as you could guess, but uh, I, there, I, you know, he's, and the problem is he's given credence by people who want to destroy glyphosate for one reason or another. And, and he's scaring people because he says it increases uh, in, or disease, uh, susceptibility, and, and doing other things because of this effect on this, this chelation. But I, there's no data, I mean, it, it, all right, there is some data supporting that if you treat a plant with glyphosate, it will be more sensitive to pathogens. And the reason is, is that the aromatic amino acids are involved in the form, uh, in the phytoalexins and other things that plants use to fight off disease. And so it's, it is true, and there's also work to show that one of the reasons that plants treated with glyphosate are killed is because they become more vulnerable. It's kind of like giving them a form of AIDS. They, they, they come up, become more vulnerable to uh, pathogens or to actually not to just pathogens, to saprophytes and other things because they're, they're weakened. But there's no truth to the fact that, that using that on like glyphosate resistant soybeans or where you're spraying it under trees and stuff that it's having any effect on their sensitivity to disease. So I mean there's a little piece of truth in there but not a lot. At least that's my opinion. When uh, the soil biology breaks down these chemicals, uh, what's happening to that soil biology? You mean, do they have an effect on soil microorganisms, or uh, what's happening to the herbicide? What's happening to the survival of the uh, biological component oh, okay. of the soil? There's been a lot of work that's done on that, on the effects of herbicide on soil microbial activity. And to my knowledge, they've never seen any major effects because again, the herbicides are used at fairly low rates. And, uh, and most of these herbicides are not antimicrobial. So you don't, you, you don't tend to see any changes in the soil microbial populations as these herbicides are degraded. Uh, as I said, with atrazine, we have selected for bugs that can degrade it more rapidly, and that's tend to be what you, do, you see. But I haven't, I don't know of too much literature where you 
you, you change the biota very much one way or the other with the herbicides. Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, um, lots of new herbicide, um, take the bottles that you've done with the in Australia for probably three years or something like that. Um, any comments on how that reacts relative to atrazine? Does my product would be replacing? Yeah, I'm not a, I, I don't know the structure of terbuthiazine, I should, so it's hard for me to speculate. I mean, as I said earlier, if, if it has a similar substitution pattern, I don't know if it's, if it's chlorinated, I mean, if it has a sim similar distribution pattern of, of, of substituents on a triazine ring, then it would probably be susceptible to this degradation. I mean, the reason they're going with triazine is because it's degraded more rapidly in the soil. And so it doesn't, you don't tend to find it in this, in the, I mean, at least in Europe, it's considered a safer alternative to try atrazine. Uh, but I don't know as much about that product, so I'm afraid I don't want to really speculate because I don't really know how it's degraded or anything. We, we don't have it in the States, and so I've never looked at it. Probably ought to have a BASF answer that question, but uh, I know at least in the states when we develop the Clearfield crops, we have a stewardship program, and I assume you have something similar here, because we know with the Group B herbicides, particularly the imidazole knowns, uh, it's relatively easy to select for resistance, and uh, if you, because there's multiple mutations in the target site that can give you resistance, and so if you depend on uh, the imidazolone alone to give you control, it's, it's probably not going to last very long. And that's why there's a, uh, you know, we've had clearfield rice, for example, we've had clearfield wheat uh, in the United States, and uh, there's very limited, uh, at this point in time, of uh, selecting for resistance in the, the, we're mainly targeting grasses in the uh, clearfield wheat population, but I think Knock on wood, the farmers have gotten the message that if they want to maintain this technology, they've got to use it in a, in a good fashion, not use that herbicide alone, use other herbicides, make sure it's in a rotation. Uh, I think in the clearfield wheat situation, they can't go clearfield on clearfield. Uh, they have to rotate to something else in order to uh, kind of, and use other herbicides to manage resistance. Same thing in clearfield sunflowers and, and uh, well, clearfield rice is probably the most susceptible to getting resistance, and uh, in that case, red rice is a real problem, which is a wild, weedy rice. And in the States, we haven't had a problem, but they introduced it into South America, and farmers were applying or growing clearfield on clearfield and using or the herbicides, imidazolones, and they've got glyphosate imidazolone resistant wild rice now. So they weren't applying, they weren't doing the stewardship program. And, so that's what's going to happen to any of the, any Group B herbicides if it's overused. Just just a comment from just a comment from BASF. I agree uh, completely with 
here to mention of the Stewardship of American Labor Day is a technical publication. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm in a technical role on the commercial side, but I don't, and, and the product handled through CropCare, so I don't have that intricate uh, knowledge of exactly how it's stewarded, but it certainly does exist. It certainly was a requirement for registration to be filled from and have us in Australia. Um, I believe it's administered through the distribution. Somebody in commercial answer that, might that be? <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, certain herbicides would never see the light of day if you didn't have a safener in them. But uh, in general, many, well, most of the Group A herbicides used in wheat have a safener. Uh, we ha they ha use a safener in dicamba to give more tolerance in corn. I don't know if it's ever registered here in, in Australia, but I know we have it in the States. Um, and uh, so, and the use of safeners, used to like, I don't know if you use... Uh, Concept seed here with metolachlor. I mean, that's a safener system. So safeners are a very viable way to broaden the spectrum, but mostly to give you better selectivity on the crop. I mean, isoxaflutol comes with a safener now, and uh, and that makes it much less uh, injurious to corn, for example. 
was probably the, the best at controlling uh, in the fellows, the best, the best control of medium to large feather top. Now, that didn't sort of come true in your presentation, I didn't think. So I'd be interested whether you actually looked at that. And if that's the case, and if there's some opportunities maybe to get some Category 25 registrations or something like that, like I say, this is useful to mix like that and provide them with other knocking. Why aren't we doing some work on, on feather top to find out just where the, what the levels of resistance are? I mean, just be, it's, it's one of our worst weed problems. And yet you're saying you don't send it in, you don't want to know about it because it's not on any labels. Basically, uh, if we test like say resistance, what's been the change basically between the state players, the black oil and the blue dots or utility plants to get up between 40 and 80 percent of the So both of those mine are useless to the extent of the recommendations. your concerns about doing research, if you have a meeting, a small in-house meeting about research and energy, we'll take that on board in terms of doing research on the specific problem.
ਚਪਾਣ 